Good afternoon. Welcome to TechSap Live. My name is Jim Warren. I'll be your host today. Uh, we are pleased to have Glenn Dvorak with us today with Hunter Industries. Glenn, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Jim. Thanks for the opportunity to be here with you today. Good deal. Good deal. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, we've got uh, got an interesting program today. We're going to continue our TechSap Live series on ride and smoothness this week. Uh, we, we covered Danny Gerhardt was with us last week. We talked about uh, some of the other ideas about noise and, and and ride and the benefits of all that. But today we're going to get into a little bit more detail on, on actual text at our text dots, ride specification and getting in some detail. So uh, I know you were having a conversation with Chuck earlier when you're talking about the different ride schedules and tell me how, from what I understand, you think those are in pretty good shape. So tell me a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, Jim. Uh, so I went and looked at the projects that, um, are located in the districts we work in, and we work in primarily six districts. And what I find is that TxDOT does, for the most part, follow their statewide guidance. Uh, a couple of projects that I did see that they did, and it was because districts had their own policy, and they made some adjustments to the statewide. Okay. But for the most part, they do follow the statewide guidance. Well, good deal. Good deal. Good deal. So let's get into it uh, today. And let's. You want to be talking? Want to talk about uh, new construction and rehab and the ride spec and and what tools we can use to try to make make things better. Uh, let's get into it. Sure. So whether you select a Schedule 1 or Schedule 2, you still need the tools uh, in the plans to be able to achieve those schedules. And, and if you want to see somebody that is excited about a project after it's complete, have an IRF 30 show up as a final product, and everybody's going to be really excited. That's impressive. But we have to have the tools to get there. Right. And what... I would like to talk about first, uh, Jim, is let's talk about overlay projects because there's really two areas within an overlay project that are in design that really starts uh, with how the project will be constructed, of course. Okay. But let's talk about the long line paving first. Okay. What tools do we need for long line paving? Straight, and straight, straight away paving. Straight away paving. Okay. All right. So Textiles has a, a rule of thumb that you're going to improve the IRI 50% with one lift of mix. Mm -hmm. So what you would, what I would recommend you do to get a feel for what an IRI is to a road, let's go run the profile on the road and let's gather that data and let's look at it. Even before we get started. During design. During design. During design. Okay. Go go get that data. Get a get a baseline. Yes, sir. Okay. Because you want to you want to evaluate it if that's an existing hot mix surface if it's an existing seal coat or maybe even a hot mix with cracks. So you understand, you want to understand what's on the road that you're dealing with. Okay. So once you have seen that and you want to evaluate even the localized roughness and the tenth of a mile sections that are out, that'll tell you, hey, do I need a continuous level up or can I get by with the surface course, but maybe some spot tools. Okay. So what I would recommend is you get that data and look at it, but make sure you understand the texture that's on a road because a seal coat is totally different sure. than a hot mix surface. Right. The other thing I would recommend is you're going to know you're going to go out there and you're going to probably want to do some spot locations. And so, Jim, if you don't mind, I'd like for you to put up a chart. So one of the difficult things that a designer has is to determine how much spot level up that needs to be on a road. Sure. And this is a simple thing that I would do. I would set my trip meter to zero. And I would just start driving down the highway. Don't look at the road. Okay. Because when you look at the road, first of all, you don't want to take your eyes off of driving. Sure. But you're going to make yourself feel stuff that's not there. Okay. So you're really just trying to feel, get the feel of the ride, not the that's look correct. of the ride. So you're getting essentially the seat of the pants. You're getting the seat of the pants. Okay. That's exactly gotcha. right, Jim. Gotcha. So, but if I'm only doing one lift, like a surface course only, I'm going to pick up a lot more spots because I know those need to have attention. If I had a level up first and then a surface course, well, then some of these spots will be taken out by the level up, but others will need some spot level up attention. Okay. So what I've done here, I just dr drove down the road and every tenth of a mile, if I feel one, uh, it's noted in blue right here. And, and what this does, this gives me kind of a length. I can take a width and put an average rate. I usually used 165 because what happens with spot level up, the sections are longer than normally what I do because you got to take off in a landing. Mm -hmm. Or the other thing I'll do, if you look at like it's uh, around mile point 15 on the bottom of the page, you see a lot of stuff real close together. Sure. I would set up that entire length as a continuous level up. So this is a way that I could identify how much spot level up. It is an effort. This particular project was 18.8 miles long. 
That's so it takes a while to drive both sure. lanes plus passing lanes. Yep. But it's the effort that we would do during design to make sure we had the right amount of spot level up or an approximate amount of spot level up set up. That makes sense. That makes sense. So this is you're doing this on your own. Yes. Um, but we, the district really should be doing this to determine how so, much. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So during design, you want to set up some spot level up because right. not every road is going to be perfect. But go ride the road. If it's an existing hot mix surface, you can truly look at the IRI data that uh, you received and you can get a feel for it and you can even compare it to the feel when you drive. But those that have like a seal coat surface where the texture is a little bit different, you may be getting some higher IRI values. This is an exercise you want to do to try to determine how much spot location, in this case, level up. So, you want to so, do. The, so the IRI, if you just ran the IRI and it went through both the, dent, the hot mix and the seal coat, it would pick up the seal coat as a as a rougher surface, even though yes. it necessarily wouldn't. It's wouldn't a rougher. Be. It picks up more texture, so your right. eye is going to have a higher value. Right. But when you go out there and drive it by the seat of the pants, you're probably going to go, hey, this is a pretty smooth ride. But okay. then you want to pick up these isolated areas for spot locations, and let's start with spot level up. And so this is an exercise that I always would do just to try to determine how much we need on the spot location. Judge, that makes sense. That makes See, sense. One thing that occurs with um, – with a Schedule 1 or a Schedule 2, mm -hmm. like say, the rule of thumb is it's going to improve 50% each time. Right. But you're not going to fix all these really isolated areas that have a real high RI value because they will ultimately still be in the surface. They won't be as bad. They'll be minimized. But when you start doing this and you realize, hey, if I'd have done some spot level up there, this this location would have been improved just like the rest of the road. Right. So if you've got a hundred and you your average ISO 150 starting out, mm -hmm. and and but you there's some areas in there that are maybe 250. Yes. By doing spot level up, you're not going to fix all the 250 stuff. You're going to get it's going to improve, but it's not going to improve at the same rate. That's correct. As the other yes. stuff is, but by identifying and working on those specific areas, mm -hmm. then when you do your then when you do your level up. Then you're going to have everything, kind of get everything yeah. ready. In other uh, words, some areas need three three locations or three opportunities. Sure. And spot level of being an opportunity. Got a it's not hole. a smoothness opportunity, but it's an opportunity to get it to a, a, a good RI. I got you. Absolutely. I got you. That makes sense. Yes. That makes sense. So um, where do we go from there? Yeah. Um, so now let's go look at the design. Okay. okay? Whether you're going to do just a surface course or a level up. Uh, let's see what we need to do from the standpoint of do we need my uh, I'm sorry uh, profile milling okay um, what do we need to do at our bridges let's look at our fixed features and we're going to go through some of those okay but before we get off the long line paving what I'd recommend is see how many smoothest opportunities you have determine your spot locations and level up and of course pavement repair is always going to be part of any project but that's what I would say is part of your long line process to address right quality. So you've got a really systematic way of going through this to try to make it the, the best you possibly can with what you got. Yes. Okay. But that's not but not overspending in is, areas yeah. that you really don't need to, but fixing the worst first, yes. but then building yourself back up. That's correct. Okay. Absolutely. Gotcha. So the next thing that comes in is actually fixed features because we can do the best long line paving. But if we've got things in the way of the paver, they're going to show up in localized roughness. You're going to see them every time you ride the road. And the, and the best thing I can say about fixed features is we want the paver to pave without being tied to anything. We want it to mm. do its job. But to do its job, certain things have to be considered during the design phase. So let's just talk about bridge ends. Everybody okay. likes to have that uh, perfect bridge end, a good transition to it. A rule of thumb that Textile uses is one inch per hundred feet. That's great. Not a problem. But sometimes the geometrics or just the vertical alignment mm -hmm. uh, coming into it just doesn't allow even that to be enough. And you may need to do more. Okay. I was recently on a project that had a lot of bridges. And what they did, they took the same distance off of the bridge in, but they all rode differently because they didn't make the adjustments. Some needed to have a longer transition okay. to get to be able to allow that paver to tie directly into that bridge slab. So give us a transition length. Mm -hmm. One inch per hundred is a good start. But let's see if we need to adjust it in the field. Sure. And we're going to talk about the field here in a little bit. OK, good. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about intersections, Jim. I think we have a photo. Yep. There we go. Yeah. So. 
here again, we'll you'll see districts set up milling, whether full width or just in the outside lane of a curb and gutter section. Mm -hmm. And we'll mill straight through the intersection because no milling was set up at the intersection. Well, what happens, you want our paver to do its job, but yet if we don't have milling done on the intersection, now we have to tie into it. So you basically have made us go to a manual operation on our on our paver to tie into that. And you're and trying to float into that. And that, that takes some skill. It does. Yeah. Yes, it does. But instead of letting the skis do their job, we're forced to do like a manual to tie into that existing street because it wasn't milled. So the recommendation here is, hey, if you can at least do a three or, or a deeper depth, 10 feet paver width, and let our main lane be paved like it's supposed to, okay. but let the intersection tie in to our main lane instead of vice versa. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, because what we're sense. trying to do is we don't want anything to control our paver. We want it to do its job. And so that's what this particular intersection detail I'm just trying to show. Okay. Hey, set up some milling on the intersection if you set up milling on your travel lane. That makes sense. That makes sense. You know, Jim, you can, uh, let's see, I think we had a different photo for an inlet probably. There we go. Yeah. So um, I wanted to use this photo. Sorry, it doesn't look to be too clear, but I wanted to use this photo for a couple of reasons. One, we're in a curb and gutter section. Mm -hmm. And... Um, like I just mentioned earlier, districts either set up milling the outside lane only or they'll do the full width. Okay. But what happens here is sometimes a district will set up one milling pass in the outside lane adjacent to the uh, curb and gutter. When you do that, you're forcing us to put a break in our paver. We've got to tie into an adjacent uh, inside lane. We've got to tie into a gutter. Now, gutter's not showing in this, in this picture, mm -hmm. but... And then we've got to clear that point that we put in the middle of the travel lane. So please try to do a full lane width mill when you set up milling in the outside lane. Because okay. we want, once again, we want the paver to do its job. But if we got to contend with three points, something's going to be touched yeah. the entire time. So we're not dragging. Yeah, the paver can only make two adjustments. So yes. if you've got more than that, if you're trying to do, you know, we, are, we, we talk about in some of the other classes, you know, if you're trying to do, ride thickness uh yields all that at one time and the surface isn't right there, there's just no way you can do it so it's you, very difficult you've got to pick pick a couple and yes. then go from there absolutely yeah so the other part of this photo is about the uh, uh projects that have a curb only uh but yet inlet aprons are constructed and these inlet aprons are like 18 inches okay. uh, wide these are extremely difficult to pave around because there's a couple ways that contractors do this. They can either pull up to the apron and they're going to bring in their screed, go along the face, right. stop, and slide it back and out. slide it back out. And then every time you stop that and you pull that screed, you're going to cause a localized roughness. Typically, it's a dip and it's just very difficult. I've seen some where they try to do a transition before mm -hmm. and after. What happens there, then you're asking for a lot of raking by hand, shoveling, raking by hand. You're going to get some uh, segregation, yep. and it just doesn't look good. The, the, I wanted to bring this picture up, not only because they're difficult to pave, but if we set up a gutter with this, that is so much easier to pave against than an isolated uh, inlet apron like this. Sure. That makes sense. That and makes sense. Jim, the other thing that happens when you overlay this project in the future, that dip even gets worse because the inlet apron is at one slope, and the travel lane is going to be overlaid at a different slope, and it actually so becomes worse. So you're going to rock, kind of rock through there as you go. Or through. just some type of roughness, whether it's a dip, um, it's more more than likely going to be a dip. Okay. But they are in there. They're just very difficult. So please add an, a gutter where you can to these type of applications. Yeah, because uh, just to reiterate, whenever you change the width of the screed, when you pull it in, you can increase your head of material and the screed can rise. When you go to the other side, you kick your screed out. Now your head of material can drop, and the screed typically drops. You can actually get a rise and a drop yes. within a very short period of time doing this. So, it, And it's certainly, as you're driving down the road, you're certainly going to feel that. So, Jim, the point, though, is just like the intersection, let's have the right tools in the plan so yep. the paver can do its job without any kind of disruptions to the paving operation. Agreed. So let's talk about crack seal. I, did, I didn't have a photo of crack seal. Everybody kind of understands that. Um the majority of the crack seal material used in Texas has uh, crumb rubber to it. Mm -hmm. 
And so when a hot mix material go, is paved over it, you're going to get a reflective bump. And that's going to show up in your IRI uh, data. It's going to show up in the localized roughness. Possibly even tenth of a mile uh, sections are going to be out of tolerance greater than 95. And uh, there's a couple of things that I've heard that can work. One is one that I know works really well is, is to put a seal coat on it. OK, it is one of the best mitigation tools. Another opportunity is maybe to use warm mix. I have not seen that or used that, but I just know the use of a uh, seal coat first will eliminate that and take care of those reflective bumps that come through. So keep that in mind. Yeah, I think I think the other thing I'd just like to weigh in there is make sure they you limit how much seal coat you put or how much crack seal you put in those areas. Sometimes you want to overfill those and those will be the first to reflect up. Generally, yeah. if you're filling cracks, you want to keep them flush or just under. You don't need to overfill them, particularly if you're going to overlay, because that stuff's going to mobilize mm. as soon as you put heat to it. I've seen situations where they did try warm mix, and it didn't mobilize that crack seal up, but it does work. So, yeah. um, so there's, like you said, there's a, the seal option, um, the warm mix option, but make sure when they're air sealing, um, they're not they're not overdoing it, even though Absolutely. they're, you know, they're right. just keeping it right at or, or just underneath. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, another area that uh, is always common is our manhole and water valves. Mm -hmm. um, if, if they're sticking up too high, you know, we got to do something. We're going to pave up to them. Or we're going to lift up and go over them or hopefully they're low enough where we can just pave over them. But a lot of times what we encounter, Jim, is when it's in like an old section of town. They want us to mill the road and they want us to put it back to a cross slope. It's just gone through a lot of maintenance work. Sure. When you do that, now those manholes may not be at the right level or at the right angle. Right. But anytime we can have a manhole down below first and let us pave over it, you're going to get a better job. And then let's adjust those manhole and water valves afterwards. After. Absolutely. I, I agree 100 percent, 100 percent with that. We were on Chuck and I were looking at a project on Friday. It wasn't a DOT project, but it was another project. And man, they had water valves sticking up eight, 10 inches. And yeah. There's just there's yes. going to be. You know, how do you do this? You know, yes. how do you do this? So if they would have just dropped them, they could have paved the whole street yeah. and come back up and brought them up as they go. And Chuck's a big fan of uh, dropping them as well uh, in right. the process. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Good. So those were kind of some of the fixed features I wanted to bring out okay. that need to be considered during your design phase. Sure. So we've talked about the long line paving. We talked about fixed features. And, uh, you know, those are the tools that need to be looked at and, and the design considerations that need to be put in there. So now when we move to construction, mm -hmm. we can have a con conversation about those because every contractor does things a little bit different. Sure. And so we want to visit with TxDOT and have a plan for each one of those. Good deal. Good deal. No, good deal. So where do we go from here? So let's talk about construction. Okay. Um, so together, the inspector and the superintendent, Let's look at the plans and see what tools are in there. Did they put us some spot level up? Is there some spot milling in there? Maybe there's some continuous milling. Uh, how are we going to handle the bridge ends? We're going to talk about all those so we know how to manage the project so we get a good ride. I'm telling you, when everybody gets a 30, they are going to be very excited. But they don't happen. That 30 won't happen without having a conversation and everybody being on the same page as to what we're going to do. And, and have that early enough to really develop a plan. Don't show up Monday morning ready to pave and say, okay, now what are we going to do? Right. Have that discussion ahead of time. Have a plan. Have a contingency plan, you know, if you find something or something goes wrong. Um, but, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you, if you plan for success, you've got a chance of succeeding. Mm -hmm. If you just show up, you're going to get what you get. You know, yes. and I think that's a, and I think that's where an there's a big opportunity there for, yes, sir. for everybody. So, Jim, if you can, put up that um, spot level up chart that I had. Okay. And there we go. So, actually, what I've done with this chart on on this particular project is I went out there and just identified spot locations. And I do know I have spot ACP level up at the top, but that was to help designers. And But I can use this for mm -hmm. construction. So, I went out there and I identified everything that I thought needed to be address before we do our surface course because this okay. project only had a surface course okay. it did have spot level up but after i did this and i gave it to the inspector and i, and I showed him I, I said hey i think we need to talk about these areas but i want you to go ride it and see if you concur with them okay and so the inspector did and what we did at, after that we decided okay can we do spot milling 
Can we do ACP level up? Which one of these, which tool do we really need to use here? This particular project had bridges on it, so we had a milling machine. The mid, uh, we had to tie into the bridge ends plus get mix off the bridge. So it was an opportunity for us to have a conversation to use two different tools. Sure. But we wanted to be on the same page as to how we use these tools. And so it goes back and forth. And everybody's idea is good. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to participate and have a buy in because okay. it's our project. When I say ours, we're talking textile and the contractors. Gotcha. And so we went through this exercise together to make sure that we're on the same page and we're going to implement these particular tools. That makes sense. So you're, you're using, like you said, all the tools in the toolbox. I can use a milling machine in some cases. I can use some spot level up. I can use a combination of them mm -hmm. in other areas, but really trying to develop the best solution for the particular project that you've got within the construct of, or the confines that, that you can work with. Yes, sir. Okay. Awesome. So Jim, one other area that um, is a good tool, of course, of milling. And, and districts will set up a full width mill, for example. What I like to recommend to the district is, can we do profile milling? Okay. Um, and there are times where the district will tell you, hey, I've got a cross slope. Maybe we need to correct. That is the perfect time to mm -hmm. do that. Let's do profile milling to improve the ride. Let's use it as a uh, put in a cross slope to help the districts address a, a cross slope, slope issue. And so whenever there's milling, always talk to them about doing profile milling. That's not a requirement that needs to be in the plans just for each individual contract. Have that contractor have that conversation with TxDOT. So, so what do you define as a profile profile milling? What what is what does that mean? Because I'm maybe thinking something maybe a little bit different. What does that mean? Yeah, to you? Typically, our milling machines have three sensors on them. We uh, some of our old ones actually had skis, mm -hmm. and so we would use those as we're milling instead of just doing a shoe, of so milling speak, for depth. And that is correct. You're just you're actually using the the, the, the electronics. Yes. To 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 take off the highs and leave the lows and and just kind of skin it out there. Yeah, if they had a two-inch mill set up, Jim, we would still mill two inches, but let the skis take out some of the highs and lows, gotcha. just like what you're saying. Okay, absolutely, perfect. Yes. Use, use the electronics. Let it. It's, yes, I mean they've got all that on there, and it's a. Uh, it, it can be it, very beneficial. It is if absolutely. we just understand it, let it let it run. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good deal. So I wanted to throw that in there. Um, so let's talk about the budget of a project. Ah, now we're now they're now we're hitting it because it's reality. Absolutely. Um, so we talked about in that previous slide. Hey, we've identified how we want to do maybe a certain amount of level up, and we want to do some milling. Mm -hmm. Maybe our pavement repair is running over, and pavement repair actually can grow since the plans were done. Oh, sure. And it could be taken care of, taking care of some of these spots. So between those three items, you may underrun, overrun, but just try to work within the budget. Okay. Because some of those are going to be give and take. Because a lot of times what I've seen is we're overrunning spot level up. Yes, you're correct. But we probably underran some milling or maybe we underran the pavement repair. So look at the tools and try to manage them together okay. to make it fit within the project. So the, the as long as the total dollar amount doesn't get whacked out, even yeah. though my quantities in each individual one may be changing, really, if that's going to give us the best project, that's really what we ought to be doing. As you said, using each of those tools in the appropriate place for mm -hmm. the appropriate reason gives us a better product by just uh, as opposed to just, you know, changing. I mean, those plans could be two, three years old. Absolutely. You know, yes. and, and with uh -huh. the with the freeze that we had this year, you know, mm -hmm. undoubtedly, we've got some areas that have got maybe some more damage than, than other areas. Maybe they can, within the context of the project, maybe mm -hmm. do some of that tool yes, swapping, if you will. Yeah. Um, and, and, but, yeah. And, and still get a better job than, than they originally anticipated. So, Jim, what I found, the, the person in design, when they go and they verify how much pay repair needs to be done, not just select a number and put in a percentage. Okay. We, we appreciate the effort, but we really need a closer number. Yep. And they make an effort to determine how much spot level up needs to be in there in the milling. You're going to find those tools are pretty interchangeable and they're going to fit the budget of the project. And, and they do fit, but that that effort has to be done in design. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at a project the other day, and it was like, well, there's 10% of the milled surface, you know, yeah, uh, for for pavement repair. It's like, well, yeah. what is it? Is it 3%? Is it 20%? 
Mm-hmm. That's going to make a huge difference when they get out there to start on a project. And so, we, again, telling people, get out there early, take a look at it. I like your idea of driving it. Get a feel, you know, and get a feel. Is is it the actual 10% that's out there or is it something significantly different? And if it is, well, then you need to escalate it. Let's get it sorted out before we get started. Right. As opposed to going, well, we used our 10% up and we only have gone a third of the way through the project. Now what do we do? Yes. You know, so again, get that's started why, early. That's why it's critical in design. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. And, yep. and Jim, what I would share, what we're doing here, on these spot locations, once again, you're going to improve the ride with a continuous course of, say, a level up, mm-hmm. 50%. Okay, you really will. But this little bit that we're doing here is what takes the project to the next level. This effort here is what it gets to win a TIXAFA award. And we're, ride, we're, we're, we're in the midst of rating them right now. So it is. tell me about that. I yeah. mean, tell me about that. I mean, you obviously, you, you've driven a lot of roads this year yeah. um, to rate these. And so... You're seeing the benefit of this kind of activity. Yeah, the detail is appearance. It, it, the detail is the effort in your detail for appearance and ride is what wins you an award. Mm-hmm. But a, a paver can't just do it by itself. It needs help. Right. And so when you focus on the little details, like what we're talking about, these spot locations, that is what it does take to get you to the next level. And Agreed. we have to execute the, those tools. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, we we I went and looked at looked at a job this year and wrote it and had a really good ride number. Mm-hmm. I went out there and it's like it just didn't ride right. Yes, sir. You know, it had a really low ride number. Yes, sir. But it didn't. It it had chatter in it. Had all this other little stuff. All the little stuff, like you mentioned, the, the little it. stuff matters. Yeah. And it ended up not doing very well from yeah. our perspective. I um, mean, and. Uh, but, I mean, that's why we go look at these things. Yeah, and just one more comment on my chart. Look, this is something I just did for myself to help me evaluate how, how to come up with a quantity of level up. Mm-hmm. And for a couple other reasons, an individual may have a better idea, and that's, that's wonderful. It just, I just wanted to share this uh, with, the, with you all today. Good deal. That's great. So now let's begin work. We all have a plan on what we're going to do in the field. And a superintendent has di- – all superintendents have different idea on how, how they want to execute the tools – they may want to do some of the spot level up at the end of the day or maybe bring in another crew. Just have a conversation on how they'll work those tools mm-hmm. in. Sure. But once we start the long line paving, whether it's a level up course or the surface course, at the end of each day, let's bring in the all hands form in mm-hmm. that we Texapa has worked up. Y'all have done a great job of identifying things to look at. This is one of the areas that need to be looked at. Are our tools working? Are we getting the ride out of our level up, out of our surface course? And if not, what do we need to do different? Just don't let it continue for like this project is 18 miles long and then have a discussion about it. That, that's not what we want to do. Yeah. So bring in that all hands form to discuss the entire project, but use it also to focus on the right quality. And did we use the tools in the right spot? Yeah, that, that, that daily debrief, as, as, yes. as, as other people, Chuck calls it, I call it, and the all hands idea is, is getting that feedback. And, you know, if you get a chance, go back and write it. You yes. know what it was before. Now you've seen what the improvement is. Mm-hmm. Let, are we going to continue that with, you know, with your chart here? And is this working? You right. know, and if it's working, yeah, let's let's continue on down the road with it. Yes. And uh, but like you said, we're not going to wait till we get to mile 17 out of 18. Mm-hmm. We want to look at mile one. We want to look yeah. at mile two. We want to look at every mile in between. And like you said, if we need to change it, we can it's- we can adjust as we go. Down the road and make any fine little details again, trying to improve right. the whole system. The key, though, is that we talk about it before we start paving. Absolutely. It's and then make some minor adjustments. You know, as Jeff Green told me one time, we had a project and he goes, "Let's strive for perfection, and we'll achieve excellence." Mm. So these little tools of the spot <laughs> locations, that's striving for per- perfection, yep. and your project will achieve excellence. Yes. Great, great, great comment. Great so comment. don't stop talking about the project. Communicate every day with the mm-hmm. inspector and superintendent, and uh, it's going to go really well, and you'll be proud of the project. Because when you get those 30s, as I've seen some of our members do, that is just a tremendous ride. That is outstanding. That's a good deal. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Jim, a couple of things we, you know, I talked about in here was really bringing in some, like, original roadway design. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you talk about, like, new design projects, you can talk about constructability. 
And I, I've noticed that, uh, that we're doing a lot more full depth hot mix type pavement sections. A recommendation I would give to the districts on that is give us two smoothness opportunities after we do the lower courses. In other words, don't do the level up by um, middle and inlay each day and give us only one surface course. Okay. If you can, let's middle inlay, but then give us a continuous level up and a continuous surface because you're asking us to put a lot of joints in. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you they're not going to be perfect because that is very difficult to uh, do every single day and be perfect. But if we can have two smoothness opportunities on top of that, mm -hmm. that will improve that mill and lay with all those joints and imperfections that may occur below. Um, yeah, I mean, I've seen situations where you've got, a, you know, an asphalt sub to a prime. You know, a lot of times they're not the same and the prime's doing little bits and little bits that are going to bring in the contractor. And, and you've got all these small little segments. Yeah that you're trying then at the end, trying to make a, a silk purse out of a sow's ear, if you will. Yes. And you may not be able to, but if you have, like you said, one continuous pass over the whole thing. Yes. Um, to try to get things sorted out. That's correct. And then yep. come in, then I think, then you've got a real opportunity to get, get and in those 30s that you're Jim, talking Jim, after about. we've done the level up, evaluate it for some more spot locations. It's okay. Mm -hmm. If we can put some mix in there and get it out, get that dip out before the surface goes on, that's certain there's certain, I just say good practice and we need to be able to do that. Good point. Um, the other picture we had up there earlier was about that um, inlet apron. Yeah. And uh, like I say, I just encourage designers to add a, a gutter to this. We can pave along a gutter by having a, a ski along the main line, along the lane line. We can use a string line over the ski, uh, the screed mm -hmm. all along the curb. Mm -hmm. And then we can do a, like a one foot extension and we can play with that one foot extension to tie into the gutter. But we have two uh, skis, right. call them skis, right. improving the ride, but we can tie into a continuous gutter. This, this situation here was just so difficult and they're always going to be a difficult spot in the future, even if when they do overlay. So I just wanted to bring in some new design type of ideas. Yeah. If we could just add a gutter to that. And anytime you can get rid of manhole and water valves, please do. And there won't be yes. one of these. There'll be, you know, these every, it's not like there's just one of these on the job. There's a bunch of these on the yeah, job. Yeah, they're, you know, they're probably less than, well, they're all different. But, yeah, you yeah. can have some that are two to 300 feet apart. Yeah, we saw and, just saw a job this last week. I was like, okay, because I know you're coming in to do this. And I was like, that's yeah. what he's talking about. And there it is. Yeah. And there it is. And there it is. And there it is. And the the crew trying to pave that would just be having yeah. a heck of a time. So kind of, Jim, what we've talked about is so far is we want the paver to do its job. Right. We don't want to have to – it be tied to something that we got to match. We want the skis to do themselves and find a flexible way of tying in right. streets, those inlets. Um, we want the milling width to match the paver width. Don't do that seven-foot pass. Set up the 12-foot so we get a good cross slope – I mean, straight line across there mm -hmm. so our paver can do its job. And probably the other thing I wanted to talk about, Jim, is um, so when we started this in the Yoakum District, putting all these tools in there, we were just totally focused on ride. I mean, that was our number one thing. We wanted to have the ride because we know roadways with a great ride are going to last longer. Yes. <laughs> demonstrated. They just do. Yep. Demonstrated. But here's what we actually also got out of this. When we did those tools first, with or without a continuous level up. It allowed our surface course to be paved at a consistent depth. Yep. When it's paved at a consistent depth, you have a better opportunity to have uniform densities yep. in place air voids. I'm sorry. Absolutely. And so that to me is actually one of the best things that came out of the focus that we put on ride is how uniform our surface was from a depth in place air void. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what contributes to our long lasting pavements as well. And, uh, and that's very well documented as well about increasing density, about uniformity of density, uh, about, about longevity. So not only does ride give you longer lasting pavements, mm -hmm. better density gives you longer lasting pavements. So what do we raise up with? A longer lasting pavement. So yes, it's, it's a win win. It, it is. Yep. Um, and Jim, the other thing I wanted to just kind of share is um, I didn't really talk about how to set up the tools for a certain type of roadway, okay. you know, like for an FM, for an interstate. The, the approach was, I can't 
I can't understand it. I probably can't teach somebody different ways of doing it, how to set up the tools, how many smoothest opportunities do we need just because it's an FM road or an interstate. I just took the approach. We're going to take this philosophy and we're going to apply it to every road mm. and then apply the correct schedule in the course with the text uh, guidance document. And that to me is a, is a great way for people to understand how to implement tools if you're consistent with one message instead of trying to teach them three or four. It's a, it's a you're teaching them a process yes. of how to go through it and, and applying the tools instead of a, a do this, do this, do this and expect a result regardless of whatever the payment is. You're actually letting them think through the process as they're going and make good decisions based on, but they do need to understand what the tools can do and yes. what they can't do. So I think that's maybe, you know, maybe somewhere we can help the designers a little bit, making sure they understand all the tools in the toolbox, mm -hmm. but then understand a hammer isn't a screwdriver and a screwdriver isn't a chisel. Yes, sir, <laughs> and, we use, and we use the right thing in the right place. Yeah. yeah. So our approach is really to try to keep it as simple as possible. The key to, to making this work starts in design with the inspector and the superintendent. When they figure this out together, mm -hmm. their relationship is improved Sure, because they're both buying into it. They get to manage the, well, the area office probably gets to manage the budget. I shouldn't say the inspector. Gotcha. But they had buy into it, and, and that's what made it successful as well. That makes sense. That yes, makes sir. sense. Good stuff. Good stuff. So where are we at? I was just... I, I'm, I'm, You're I'm good. done. I mean, I could talk awesome. about this, but you only gave me, a, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes here. I can't remember. But, um, Jim, not every road is the same. Each one has to be evaluated its own uh, condition and how, what tools you put in there. Spot okay. level up, spot milling, continuous level up. Allow the contractor to use profile milling, level up layer. Uh, the other thing on a continuous level up, I, I did want to say this. I apologize. But. A one inch level up doesn't really improve it a lot. You need at least an inch and a half if you're truly trying to improve it 50 percent mm. because a one inch level up does not typically give you that opportunity. There's just not so, enough in there to fill in the lows. That's correct. Yeah, absolutely. You got to yeah. use the right mix design for those level ups. too. There what, you go. What do you recommend for a, a one inch and a half level up? You know, so our philosophy was we use one PG binder less than the surface. OK. Uh, typically, we did type D dense graded. We got into some super pave eventually. Uh, we didn't have SMAs, but typically our philosophy was whatever's on the surface course we put below. Okay. And we use one PG grade binder less. And typically, it was all type D dog mixes. Okay. Very yes. good. Very good. Well, Glenn, I appreciate the, appreciate you coming out today. Um, I thought you did a great job. But it's really good information. Good for everybody. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, again, just. Uh, you know, there's a lot of little details when it comes to smoothness. You know, there's great benefits uh, with this whole process, but we have to look at the we, we have to sweat the small stuff in yes. order to get these smooth rides. And I think, like you said, we get a smooth ride. We also have our opportunity to get a a, a better overlay on top. The finished surface has a better chance of, of, of being uniform and proper thickness and getting the right amount of density all of which is going to give us longer lasting performance yes. and, and, and great job. So Glenn, thank you so much for coming out today. I want to uh, thank everybody for, for tuning in. Be safe. Uh, take care of everybody and uh, ever forward.